Okay, we are going to get knee deep into the sound and music chapter. This is not the radio chapter. This is the, this is the chapter about music and sound recording. So we're going to start class this week by talking about how music makes us feel. Obviously, it can change our emotions like no other medium, maybe except for movies, but we'll talk about that more in class. Here's the guy that invented Pandora, and this is a quote he has about music, and I think he's right on target. In fact, we're going to have a, a Twitter discussion on this topic exactly. Music contains our memory. And my family actually makes fun of me because I can hear a song and know the month and the year that it was popular or released. And I have very specific memories to, attached to hundreds of songs. And I know that you all probably do too. We don't typically even notice music, especially when it's used really well in movies. So I'm going to show you a couple famous movie scenes with and without the music when we get to class. Any time in this course when I ask you who invented something in the mass media, your best bet is to always guess Thomas Edison. He pretty much <laughs> invented everything. He made a recording um, in 1877 that played back voices, and he called it the phonograph. Okay, so he only played back voices. Emil Berliner took that one step further. Of course, it took about 100 years. What he did was record voices on flat metal discs that had ridges. Okay, so he invented the gramophone that would put a needle inside this flat metal disc and play it. So he was the one that invented the idea of master recordings. Okay, so obviously his big flat metal disc was the precursor to the black vinyl record, which my kids used to call the big black CDs. So Berliner's flat disc was fine until the Germans developed audio tape in the 1940s. What you're looking at here is a picture of a real to real player. It's kind of the grandfather of the cassette tape. Next came the 8-track. Eight 8-tracks eight actually only had four tracks. I don't know why they were called 8-tracks. They had four tracks, and if, you want, if the song you wanted to hear was the third track, or the third song on track three, you had to go to track three and then listen to the first two songs to hear the song you wanted. I know, you had to wait. Then came cassette tapes. Cassette tapes were huge um, when I was your age. In fact, the mixtape was the greatest declaration of love you could make for a person because it took forever. Think about it this way. If you want to burn a CD for somebody, you can make a playlist on iTunes like that. Hit record or hit burn and two minutes later you have a CD, right? In order to make a mixtape, you had to play the vinyl record and hit play and record on your cassette player the same time. So it was all done in real time. If you made somebody a 90 minute mixtape, it took you at least 90 minutes because you had to listen to it while it was recording. It was a true labor of love. A lot of times the tape in a cassette tape would get really old and it would break so then you'd have to pull the tape out, splice it with some scotch tape, get a pencil and reel it back in. Old technology. But it used to be hip, I swear. You're looking at a picture of my 1982 Christmas present. It was a Sony Walkman. It took eight AA batteries at a time, it cost $280. Yeah. Now, like, banks give these things away. Well, they don't even, no, no, they don't. Nobody even makes, <laughs> nobody even makes cassettes anymore. Technology gets better, faster, and cheaper. It's a magical thing. All right, so digital recording came about in the late 1970s. CDs came on the market in 1983. CDs are much more durable than vinyl. They're portable. Uh, they're certainly more durable than cassette tapes. Um, in fact, CDs started overtaking cassette sales and LP sales. Here's a chart from 1980. If you notice, the LPs, the records, were still the biggest piece of the pie. By 85, cassettes had taken over. And by 2004, it was all CD. Now, if you notice in this, in this chart, the tiny little purple sliver those are digital, digital downloads. Now, just um, four years ago, you can see that the digital downloads are starting to take up a bigger piece of the pie. CDs are, were only about half of music sales back in 2010. I am sure that they are less than that now. I can't tell you the last time I bought a full CD, like I went to Best Buy and bought a CD. I couldn't tell you the last time I did that. It's great now because you don't have to buy a complete full album of crap if you want one song. You can just download the individual song. So in 1992, the MP3 file is, is introduced, led to file sharing, Napster. The recording industry made a huge mistake when Napster came out. 
they should have gotten on the bandwagon, built up websites so people could buy and download MP3 files from the record companies themselves. They missed the boat. I want you to think about if radio is still relevant. Um, I have satellite radio in my car. I cannot tell you the last time that I actually listened to a terrestrial radio station. Terrestrial meaning um, land-based, okay? Um, unless there's really bad weather or listening to Cardinal Games. That's pretty much the only time. I'm curious to see what you all think about this. Your books list these as music genres. St. Louis is a very small market, so we don't have all of these. We have a few, but we certainly don't have all of these genres. Microcasting is alive and well in the radio industry, thankfully. Because of Pandora and Spotify and GrooveShark and um, Apple Genius, we rarely have to listen to any songs that we don't like. In fact, it's so fabulous that if we want to hear a song we like, we can just press a button and hear it immediately. We don't have to fast forward through the cassette. We don't have to listen to other songs on the 8-track. We can hear it immediately. And I would venture to guess that your Spotify playlist and your Pandora radio station list are like no one else's on the planet. They're yours. That is microcasting. And it's fabulous. I mean, as a consumer now, you have more choices than ever. One thing that I want you to think about is how this has changed the communication model. If you remember from the very first week, we talked about this communication model. There's a sender, there's a message, a receiver, right? Okay, with terrestrial radio, Say, for example, Z1077 is the sender of the, of the message. The message is a song. Who chose that song? It was them, okay? And then I'm the receiver of the message. What feedback can I give them? Well, if I don't like the song, I can change the station. Maybe I could email them. It's really not a whole lot of feedback. Now, imagine that you're listening to Pandora now, okay? Who has chosen the song that you're listening to on Pandora? Well, Pandora probably initially has, but you've told Pandora whether or not you like it. So they're playing it with your approval. Think of it on Spotify. Who has chosen the song that you're listening to? You have. Who's listening to the song? You are. So with these new music websites, you are actually the sender and the receiver at the same time. And the feedback that you can give is immediate. So what I'm trying to tell y'all is that you're spoiled when it comes to music, and I'm jealous. <laughs> because if I had had Pandora when I was in high school and college, I would have never graduated. Really, I wouldn't. Your books list a few issues facing the music industry. Um, homogenization, which means the accusation that everything on the radio sounds the same. And there's a great cartoon I'm going to show you of uh, essentially saying that every pop song includes Pitbull, which is true. Another issue they say is an, um, kind of a big deal is questionable song lyrics. I don't think people really get riled up about that the way they used to. And then your book also mentions the idea of selling out, that a lot of music um, professionals sell out their artistic integrity in order to make more money. Yeah. I don't know what I think about it. Here are issues facing the industry, in my opinion. The death of the album is significant. Albums is how record companies used to make all their money. No one buys albums anymore. We only buy individual songs. Also, the idea of if music is a product or a service, and why that is significant is that if it is determined to be a product like Spotify and Pandora, the government will attempt to tax it. And would you be willing to pay taxes on those music streaming services? I think it's neat that now discovery of, muses, of musicians has now uh, been democratized. You know, it doesn't take a record executive to go to a club and find an artist anymore. The artists are discovered on YouTube. On my, Where did Justin Bieber get started? MySpace, right? Or YouTube. We now are telling record companies what we like. And I think that's awesome. The biggest issue I think facing the music industry is Apple's dominance. Apple controls music distribution in the United States because record companies miss the boat. They should have set up iTunes-like websites for each of their companies, and they didn't. They were afraid of the MP3 file. Apple filled, you know, went right in and filled that niche, and now if a record company doesn't cooperate with iTunes, the song does not get sold. Apple has every record company over a barrel. 
and they, they missed their chance. They missed their chance. The big four refers to the big four music companies that basically own everything. It's EMI, Warner, Sony BMG, and Universal. These are held by enormous multinational media conglomerates who are most interested in profit than anything else. And this was where the homogenization comes in. For example, um, oh, let's pick on Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift is very popular. She makes a lot of money. So if you are a profit-centered business, aren't you going to sign artists that sound an awful lot like someone who has also made a lot of money already? You don't want to take any risks. Risks cost money. So you're going to sign artists that already sound like people who have made money. That's the homogenization idea. And it's too bad that these enormous companies are so profit-based, they really won't take a risk. Record companies used to make a ton of money on albums, and the bands made money on tours. That doesn't work anymore. Album sales are down. Tour revenue is down. So there's not as much money in the music industry as there used to be. And this is kind of a fun chart, even though not many of us go to Best Buy or wherever to buy CDs anymore. The biggest chunk of profit actually goes to the retail overhead of where you buy your CD. So if you go to Best Buy and buy a CD, the biggest chunk of that money goes to Best Buy to pay for their employees, their insurance, their electricity, their plumbing, their advertising. Very little actually goes to the artist royalty or the writer of the song. But remember, the writer of the song is the one that gets the copyright, not necessarily the performer. The writer of the song is, the, is really the one that gets the most money. OK Go is such a fun band. Their videos are amazing. What's neat about them is, well, I don't know if neat is the right word, but they're actually in kind of a fight with their record company. Did you know that every time a music video is played on YouTube, the record company gets royalties from that? Well, OK Go would like their fans to be able to embed their videos on their fans' websites, a way to spread the news about OK Go. Okay? Well, the record company won't let that happen because if a site, if a, a different site other than YouTube has these videos, the record company won't get any money. So OK Go has been very open and public about their animosity towards their record company because they think it's not fair to the fans. If this kind of thing interests you at all, look it up. It's a pretty fascinating story. There's three terms you absolutely need to know from the music recording chapter. Piracy, bootlegging, and counterfeiting. Piracy is something that we are all guilty of. It's the illegal downloading or uploading of copyrighted material. Counterfeiting is when you make a copy of that pirated material. And then bootlegging is when you tape a live performance. Anything published before 1922, however, is no longer um, copyrighted. So it's referred to as being in the public domain. If something is in the public domain, you don't have to pay copyright fees on it anymore. If something has been published, and remember music gets published also just like printed works, anything after 1978, the last surviving member has to die plus 70 years before songs go in the public domain. So it's going to be a long time before songs you hear now will be in the public domain. But this is also why classical music is usually pretty cheap, because that copyright is no longer important. Anytime you hear recorded music in public, the person playing it or the organization playing that music has paid a music licensing company for the right to play that copyrighted music. So if you're in the Student Center today and you hear music playing, that means that your university has paid either ASCAP or BMI for the privilege of playing that copyrighted music. They make a ton of money. Radio stations have to play too. Anytime you're, you hear a song in a movie soundtrack, they have paid the licensing fee. The most valuable song license in the world is, any guesses? Happy birthday. That is why if you work at a restaurant and it's someone's birthday in your section, you don't actually sing happy birthday to them, do you? You have to sing like some cheesy restaurant style version of the song. That's because your restaurant does not pay for the copyright to sing happy birthday. Crazy, huh? Okay, so these are the main points for the music chapter. We're going to do radio next, so get excited. Okay, bye.